morning. All 50 of you or 30 of you or whatever's here. Thank you for coming. It's easier than talking to an empty room. I was going to record it either way. So it's nice to have someone to talk to. Today's short will be maybe 40 minutes. I'm just going to review some stuff for the exam, talk about uh, what's left in the course, and just generally kind of wrap up things and say goodbye until the 15th. So um, that's pretty much it. Uh, does anyone have any questions before I get started? You can ask questions as well at the end. Anything you want to know about the course? No? Yes, Damien. Yeah, there's a few left that are just floating around due to a variety of reasons. I think a couple of them got stuck in the section B pack, which Michelle has, and a couple of them I have to go find. So if it hasn't shown up by the end, like by next Monday, then kind of let me know where you left it and, and what the DCL was. We'll try and track it down. I think I know for sure yours. I know where that is. I just need to upload the grade. Um, there's a couple of other people who've contacted me, similar kinds of things. One person contacted me and they had filled out their name at the top. But they used, like I guess, the name that everybody calls them, except their Trent ID and their Blackboard doesn't have that name. It's their middle name or something, and like I didn't know what it was. So I have this sitting in my office, but I'm like, I don't know who this person is. They're not in my class, but somehow they wrote the exam. So now that they sent me the email, I'm like, I know who you are. OK, I will find your exam, and I will upload it. So yeah, if it's not up by Monday, please let me know. Yes? To what, sorry? The quiz questions have been moved into the big review thing. Every single quiz question is in there. Basically what it does is it goes assignment question, quiz question, assignment question, just sequentially, and those are infinite trials um, with hints turned on and everything. So if there's a specific question that you can't seem to figure out, just let me know, and I'm happy to help. But because I've got the review thing, I suggest doing everything in that just review. No, I've moved everything from the entire course into the review, and our exam has been designed based on that set. So don't worry about all the little ones and trying to figure out what to cover. Just take that one big one and just do that, and then that's everything. OK, if, you, if other questions come to you, just raise your hand. Let me know. Um, I'm happy to take questions. We, really, we have two hours, and I don't need it at all. It's just a very basic review today. Um, so for those who have not done this, it's Tuesday. The deadlines for this is tomorrow afternoon. Please do the Blackboard evaluation. When you log into Blackboard, up at the top, there's a link that says you've got an open a course evaluation for 1051. Do that one. That's the official one that goes like get saved by the department and stuff. I've also created a much more in-depth one on Qualtrics, which I would very much appreciate you filling out. This is the first year that this course has had all these different components merged together in one course, and there were some rough spots, as you know. I want to improve that. Obviously, I'm not happy about the rough spots, but you know, the first time you do something, always things go wrong. So. In there, I've asked you a bunch of questions about specific aspects of the course. If your TA was really horrible, you can let me know. If they were really great, you can let me know. Um, and we can try and fix things for next semester for those who are continuing on. If there's aspects of the course that you really enjoyed, I'd love to hear about that. If there's aspects of the course you hated, I'd like to hear about that. And please try and be specific, because just because someone hates it doesn't mean it's bad. It may just mean it's hard. And that's not the same thing, right? And from the professor point of view, I have to balance that. This course has to be rigorous and has to actually challenge you while simultaneously being fair. I'm really looking for things where things weren't fair or were just genuinely messy and we can fix that without changing the aspect of the course. There's some parts of it that really worked well, I think, and some parts that didn't. One thing I will note there before, if you haven't filled it out, um, I've had some people giving feedback that they didn't feel like they got enough TA time. Um, bluntly, those people have no idea what it used to be like. Last year, the student uh, to TA ratio was 150 to 1. You'd go to a one hour workshop in a room this size, and someone like Carlone would be at the front. And that was what you got. You got no individual attention, no time to ask questions. It was a big, sort of almost lecture kind of workshop. So your 25 to 1 is actually pretty good. So much so, the department told me I can't do it next year. It was too, many, too much resources, too many people, too much time. This is the reality of education now. Unfortunately, we can't give you that much individualized time in a class this size. So before you make that complaint, think about what might be better. Think about what you would have liked, aside from someone sitting beside you and guiding you through it. Peacefulness, which isn't going to happen. You know, what would work? 
and, and give me intelligent feedback if you can. I really do appreciate it. I'm going to read every single one of these over the exam break, and I want to know what you thought about aspects of the course. So that link is up on Blackboard, and if you went to workshop this week, the TAs asked you to do it, so you already done it. And number three, um, the statistical comprehension outtake test, the same one we wrote in the very first week, is currently up and can be written. If you went to workshop again, you already did this. If you didn't go to workshop, the link is up and you can still do it at home. And then you will get that bonus quiz mark, which will count towards your final grade. Uh, beyond that, Michelle set the deadline for data camp to be the exam. Uh, so if you haven't done any of those and you still want to, you certainly can. You've got until the 15th to kind of get those bonus marks. Although you're about to start studying for your other finals, so I don't see that happening. Um, so I will get the final term grades up as soon as I can. Um, I'm going to try and do them for Monday next. I'm not sure I'll make it or not, but Monday or Tuesday next week, I will wrap up all of the grades from all of the bonuses and all the other things except data camp, and I'll get all of those points up on Blackboard so you can find them. So that's before the exam, sometime around the 13th. Please go through and check every single grade. Make sure they transferred properly from WebWork to Blackboard. Um, one note here, if uh, WebWork says something like 7 out of 11, nothing was out of 11. It was always out of 10. That was the attendance mark. And so this would translate, typically assuming you put in the right attendance word of the day, to 6 out of 10. And so I had a bunch of feedback on that in the first round of uploading the grades where people were like, I had a 7. I'm like, well, you had 7 out of 11. And that's not real. That means you had 6 points on the actual questions plus the attendance point. And the attendance point didn't count. It wasn't a point. It was just there to see whether you actually showed up. Um, data camp, as I said. The formula sheet will be posted by the 12th. That's the day that Michelle um, had announced. So I'm going to stick with that as well. I am actually going to go through all the formulas that are going to be on it today during this hour. So you can just take these slides and kind of make your own if you want, and then I can give you the official one. And then the final exam is on the 15th at 2 p.m. Please don't like sleep through it or something. If you sleep through a 2 p.m. exam, that's really impressive, first of all. But second of all, that there's really no mechanism for you to write late. You know, you, you can't miss this exam. The only exception is if you go to a doctor and you are dying or, you know, think you're dying. That's fine. But, you know, like it has to be something that Student Accessibility Services recognizes as a reason for missing an exam. These are serious. These are real. You have to show up. You have to write. OK. Um, we have done a lot in this term. But actually, uh, I reviewed the whole course before doing this lecture. Um, actually, it kind of all sort of fits together. Like, like when you go back over it, you're like, wow, we didn't actually do that much, or it doesn't feel like that much. Now that you're at the end and you're like, Oh, OK, I'm reviewing this. And like, I remember that, and I remember that, and I remember that. And it's not like we did stuff that was outside the lectures. You know, we, we basically covered the entire course in about 20 hours, which versus a class you know, where we have three lectures a week and stuff, we, we didn't maybe cover as much material. And that's OK. But it means that you, know, you have to know the whole course. There wasn't that much of it. So everything we covered in the course is fair game, everything in any of the lectures, anything in any of the assignments. And the quizzes were all based on the assignments, so they're essentially the same. The only uh, questions on the exam will be similar to, based on, or taken from the review assignment. Now, there's some flexibility there. We can merge questions together. We can take multiple choice and trim options off. We can change the numbers. We can change the context of the question while leaving the numbers untouched. But if you can solve every problem in that review assignment, you're going to ace the exam. It's not going to be anything worse than that. And in fact, it's going to be slightly less computational because you don't have a computer. So we have to limit what you can do there. So let's do a whirlwind review of the course. This is everything we did. This is essentially the three chapters of the book and what we did. So what did we cover in chapter one of those first three lectures? We talked about variable types. We talked about association and independence. We talked about correlation a little bit. We talked about how we gather data. We talked about sampling. We talked about random sampling. We talked about the difference between an observational study and an experiment. I strongly encourage you to review the chart. Remember the big one? It had a bunch of different options and looked like that. Review that one. It's really good for kind of making sure you remember what you can generalize from a study. 
Once you do a study, what does it mean? What can you say about it? We talked about numerical data visualizations with dot plots and scatter plots and histograms. And by this point, histograms should be very familiar to you. We've used them and abused them all semester. At some point, you should have figured out how they work. We talked about the mean and the variance and the standard deviation. You will be expected to be able to do very simple computations on a hand calculator for those things. Or to know how you would do it in R. Either or. We can ask you both questions. And so the formulas for these do show up in a couple of slides. We talked about what the median is and the interquartile range and finding quartiles. You will not be expected to do those two by hand. They're too complicated. This one, I can totally ask you to do by hand. The median is easy. It's the middle number. You just sort them and you find the middle number. Question? Um, can you go over how you can figure out standard deviation? So you don't have a question if the standard deviation will decrease if... I don't actually know what you mean when you say standard deviation will decrease. If, if, if you're given a graph, yeah. Okay, so, so that kind of thing, when you're talking about standard deviation, remember, standard deviation is a measurement of spread. It's how spread out the things are. You look at the x-axis, you look at how spread out it is, and you can tell relative to one another. We will not expect you to be able to look at a graph and identify the standard deviation from the graph. That's just silly. Because there's no easy way to do that. The only example we had where we did something like that, we were able to say, it was a histogram, we were able to count the bins and go, this is 75, this is 95%, 95% is about too standard, so the, but that's, that's messy and it makes a bad exam question. So no, don't worry about that, it'll, it'll be okay. As far as computing it, um, this, the formula will be given to you and that's fair game, but we'll keep the numbers really small because it's not interesting to make you do a hand calculator thing with 15 numbers. It's provided. You bring nothing. Walk in with pens, pencils, possibly a ruler, in case you need to plot something, and a hand calculator. You will need a hand calculator. We will have a few questions that will require it. Not a lot, but some, just to basically show that you are basically arithmetically numerate. You can add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Maybe compute a z-score or something like that. That's about the extent of it. Um, and contingency tables, if you remember when you do your review, actually we introduced contingency tables back in chapter one and then we reused them at the end of chapter three when we did two-way and one-way tests. So that's chapter one. Chapter two, we introduced the concepts, the philosophy behind hypothesis tests. We talked about permutation tests for one and two proportions. This one, because of the lab exam, should be very familiar to you. You should actually know what you're doing with one of those and be able to talk me through how you would do one. Obviously, you can't do one by hand. But if I ask you a question about how you would do it, how would you set up your bag of cards, what would you do, you should be able to actually explain it to me. Because at this point, you've done it and done it, and we've done it multiple times in class, and it's the kind of concept that you should have understood the philosophy of what's going on. Two proportion permutation tests. We talked about what the meaning of a p-value was and statistical significance with different alpha levels. You know about the default alpha level. All of that was covered. Then we introduced the concept of testing, one-tailed and two-tailed testing, and the concepts of type one and type two errors. So these tend to show up through multiple choice, and they do tend to be fairly tricky. However, if it's not on the assignment, it's not on the exam. So you can review all of the questions from those assignments from that section of the course that asked you things about type 1 errors and what it meant when things changed and when you increased alpha, what did that imply and so on and how that all interrelated. And you can study those questions because that's the way we're going to present it on the final. Continuing in chapter 2, chapter 2 was fairly long. We talked about the central limit theorem and what it implied and how as you get more points, the convergence of the shape of the distribution goes to the normal, which meant we also did this sort of divergence where we talked briefly about the normal distribution. And then we talked about z-scores. And that was a period where we actually spent three assignments on computation of z-scores and z-probabilities. That's three out of 11. 
That means a significant part of the exam is going to be on exactly that. Now, you have no laptop. You can't compute a P norm or a Q norm or whatever. You can, however, show me you understand how you would do so if you did have a laptop. And that's how we're going to be pushing the problems, is I'll give you multiple choice with four options. And you have to identify the one that would do the thing that you actually want. And one will be one-tailed, one will be two-tailed, and so on. You'll have to just identify the right one and say, yeah, this is totally what I would do. That's the correct answer. We talked about the normal model, which is how you can compute a z-score and then use it to do a hypothesis test. And you can find the p-value, and the p-value informs your final answer and tells you what's going on. We talked about confidence intervals and how they're a little bit different. And then finally, we talked about the margin of error and the definition of a Z star. Now, again, all of this stuff, we used R. And in the real world, as soon as you leave this class, if you ever had to do it again in a real scientific context, of course you'd use R. So again, the exam is going to be focused on the idea of testing your ability to demonstrate those skills. Not necessarily to compute the numbers exactly, not necessarily to be able to kind of go through the process, but to show me you actually could do so if given the opportunity. So it's a bit tricky to write exam problems that can do that, but, but we're working on it and, and we think we've figured out ways to do it. So there will be some stuff that you have to do with hand calculator and then there'll be a bunch more stuff where you will actually just have to show me what's the command in R. What would you, what would you do in R to kind of compute this, this p-value? And you just know that it's p norm of the z that you just computed and the way you go. And you just write that down. Chapter three, we talked about hypothesis tests for single proportions with standard errors, confidence intervals, and inference. This is the full context of chapter 3.1. We had here's a proportion. Now let's actually take this p hat, compute the standard error for p hat, and proceed through the whole process. There was this sort of side project that happened in that chapter, which was if you have a single proportion test and you want it to be precise within some level, that was a confidence interval problem and you're working backwards from what you want the margin of error to be. And so you had to work your way back. We did hypothesis tests for two proportions with standard errors, confidence intervals, and inference. So this was where we now have P1 hat and P2 hat. This one people did not do very well at. For some reason, it became very difficult for people to understand the difference between the two standard error formulas. And the number of questions I wielded on, on Slack that week was insane, as people just continually made the same mistake. So as you're studying, please just put like a little star here and make sure you review the difference. They're going to be on the formula sheet, but you need to make sure you know when you use each one. That led to kind of the other way, which is the pooled estimate and when you use the pooled estimate, and that wrapped up all of our proportion material. We then spent three-ish weeks, two and a half weeks, on the chi-squared distribution, hypothesis tests for goodness of fit, which is the one-way table, hypothesis tests for two-way tables, contingency tables, with the difference between uh, independence and homogeneity. And we talked about computing p-values for those chi-squares. And then sort of all the way along the way, all the way through chapter three, there was this lingering thing that happened in every problem we did, which is does this model meet the required assumptions? In other words, does the data you have and the context of the problem you have actually qualify you for using this model? And we ask questions about that on the assignments. So those are already in that bank of problems. And so expect some of those on the exam because it's a very important thing. Really, out in the real world, no one comes along and hands you data and says, psst, guy squared two-way. They just give you data and you're expected to figure it out. And so you have to know how to look at a set of data figure out whether it meets the assumptions and requirements for a single test, and then do that test on that data. That, that's what being sort of an applied scientist is, is using statistics to answer questions about data, and no one knows the answer. So no one can give you a hint about what model is appropriate. So knowing that's actually very important, and it will absolutely be on the exam. That was the semester. So if looking at that, you were like, a couple of those were like, eh, and the rest was like, oh yeah, okay. Then that's, that's the semester. That's the exam. So obviously focus on the stuff you're not confident on, but review all of it if you have the time. 
Let's go through the formulas that I'm going to be putting on the sheet, which we will post on the 12th. First is the formula for the mean. This is really easy. It's the average of the numbers. You add them up and you divide by how many there were. It's very simple. Any scientific calculator you might bring in can probably do this with a special button. It's probably not worth the hassle. You add up the numbers and you divide by seven. It's very simple. The standard deviation, this is the formula for it. It is not a simple formula. It does require effort because you have to compute x bar first. Then you have to take all of the differences then you have to square the differences. Then you have to add them up. Then you divide by one less than the total number that you had. This is not an easy thing to do. It's not trivial. It will take effort. If I give you one of these, it will be a small number of points. So we're talking like four, maybe five, so that you can do it quickly enough that it's not a hassle. I don't want you spending 30 minutes computing a single number for two points on your exam. That seems ridiculous. So it will be a fair version. And it's just a, do you understand the order of operations you have to go through there? Do you understand that the square happens after you take the difference and so on? And basically, can you put it all together to get a number? And that's pretty much it. The interquartile range, this will be on there. Um, we are not going to expect you to compute Q3 and Q1. That's far too much work. But you need to know that the interquartile range is the distance between those two. And there was, this shows up, there was some discussion of robustness back in chapter one, where we were talking about how the median resists big values and being pulled more than the mean. And the IQR does the same thing relative to the standard deviation. The philosophy of that problem will probably show up on the exam knowing when you might use one of these things. Not necessarily computing one, but knowing how it's used. Because again, a computer will do this for you. So all you need to know is how to use it, not how to find it. The Z-score formula. We will use this. It's part of the normal. And there will be questions about the normal distribution and computation of the normal p-values and areas under the normal curve. This is the general z-score hypothesis statement computation. You take the point estimate, you subtract the null, you divide by the standard error. This is used over and over again throughout chapter three and the end of chapter two. You may not need to use it explicitly, but it will be on there so that you have it in case you want to reference something. The statement for how you do the generalized confidence interval will also be on there. And every confidence interval that we did was done this way and used said star. We didn't actually talk about any other way to do it. Next semester, that will change. In chapter four, you'll start to talk about variations of this. But for now, that's it. That's the formula. And so long as you know the right standard error, you can find the Z star by just looking it up. You're good to go. Now we're in chapter three. Chapter 3.1, we had a standard error for a P hat. And so that's actually given in the formula as standard error sub p hat. It's saying it's the standard error belonging to or assigned to p hat. And it is the square root of p 1 minus p over n. What is p here? At the back. Pardon me? Not quite, no, because the observed values will lead you to p hat. So this is, this is, again, this is the confusion that people had in chapters 3.1 and 3.2 is knowing when to use which thing. And so when you are computing this, and I'm not giving you these formulas, there are two ways to do a sub in for P. Because P doesn't, doesn't exist. We don't know it. We can't find it. So what are the possible substitutions that we could put in here for P? Damien. 0 0.5. What, what case is that? Yeah, this is like the absolute default case. That's what you would use if you're trying to find sample size, you're trying to work backwards to find the size. You would put in 0.5 if you have no information whatsoever about the problem. It's your worst case scenario. What else could we put in there? Well, 
which is p hat, right? Like, yeah. And so, yeah, absolutely, p hat is an option. You can take all of the successes divided by the total. That's p hat. You can put that in. What's the final option of what you can put into an equation like this? The null hypothesis, p naught. There are three different ways you can put in a p for that. I am not giving you those. I'm not going to write down explicitly how you use those on the equation sheet. I'll give you this formula. You need to know when it is appropriate to put in the appropriate choice. That's part of your studying for the exam. Okay? So put a big star on that one. It's something that lots of people screwed up. Make sure you get it clear in your head. Similarly, we have a standard error for two proportions where we get a formula and we have a P1 and a P2 and we don't know what those are. And again, we could put in P1 hat and P2 hat. Now, we didn't do any examples where we put in 0.5 on this two. Do you have to leave, Sky? Do you want to do your announcement? Okay, sure. Yeah. Sorry, we're just going to take a brief moment, jump to slide 27, <laughs> and then we'll come back. Standard error for two proportions. We talked about using P1 hat and P2 hat. Now, we never talked about using 0.5 in this case. Then that's fine. What about P0? What about the null hypothesis? But it's not P1 or P2. And so we never explicitly talked about putting the null hypothesis into this equation. Instead, we talked about this. And this was how we did the secondary confusion for students. And this is these two assignments, people got very confused about when to use which formula, when to substitute it in. So it's something you have to get clear in your head, and it's something you need to be able to go, oh yeah, okay, so this is this type of problem, and it's a confidence interval, so I use this one. Or it's this type of problem, and it's a hypothesis test, so I use this one. And you need to be able to identify the right substitutions and put in the right numbers, or it's wrong, and you just won't get the points for that problem. And so this was the pooled estimate of the proportion, which we could then put in with the standard error of the pooled estimate, which I will just give you. And all this is is a substitution of that p hat for p1 and p2, and then rearranging the formula. So if you're good with, the, with algebra and sort of rearranging, you can see how I did it. This is a common term between the two fractions that were inside the previous standard error formula. So you pull it out, and then what's left is the denominator and the denominator. So that's where that comes from. And so this.